Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Masaro Method. I am so excited to welcome my longtime Twitter friend, although this is also the first time we're actually speaking in person, uh, Ben Tallis. So Ben is well known to those of you who follow me on Twitter and know that he is one of these really powerful, wonderful, emerging voices for a new foreign policy in Europe. He is a senior research fellow at the German Council on Foreign Relations. He used to work for the EU in Ukraine, so he's got this wonderful background uh, in Ukraine and Ukrainian issues. And he recently published a book. I don't know if you want to show the book off, Ben. He recently published a book called To Ukraine with Love, Essays on Russia's War and Europe's Future. So you should definitely check that out. We'll link to it in the video description. As usual, please like and subscribe. Uh, it gets these videos seen and helps the channel to grow. So, Ben, wow, first time. Here we are. And we're recording, too. So this is the first ever conversation. We recorded conversation. Perfect. Hey, Paul, it's actually great to have a chance to chat finally, and especially after such great news that we had yesterday. It is amazing news. I mean, it is. And, and I, and I want to, you know, right at the beginning, give you and, of course, our friend Jessica, who's also been on the channel. I think you and Jessica have been just, you know, in Germany, major advocates for uh, getting leopards to Ukraine. I mean, much of the idea originates with you and Jessica. I mean, I mean, you know, it's just a, this is a this is something that really came out of the expert community. Uh, I, I don't think it was being thought of at all within governments until it was like, oh my God, we can do this. This is where the tanks come from. And then the advocacy, I mean, months of advocacy, and now it's done. So congratulations. I mean, huge congratulations. Well, thanks so much, Paul. I mean, you've been a huge voice yourself, and it's been great to have support from allies in all the uh, NATO countries who have clearly seen what the right thing to do is, who've been able to back us up at the right times and make sure that the message gets through directly and also through their government officials to the German decision makers who eventually made this happen. And there's a whole community of experts here, as you rightly said. I mean, we, could, we can't name them all, but Gustav Gressel, William L. Burke, Minna Orlander, previously of this parish, William. now of Finland. Um, and uh, others you may not recognize without their dog's heads on, but um, <laughs> it, it is really wonderful to have worked on something for so long. I mean, we've been advocating for this since April last year, just after uh, the Czech Republic and Poland first sent right. tanks. And to see it now happen is a, is a truly great, great moment. I mean, it is, it is, it is simply amazing. So, I, I mean, huge congratulations to you. Huge congratulations to the North Atlantic Fellows Organization, which has been, I mean, I mean, when the when the papers are written about this, the yeah. defense of Ukraine, uh, uh, NAFO will have a central, central role. Also, as kind of a a, a unique offspring of this war, I, I've never seen any kind of grassroots, kind of online democratic presence like this in in my life. So, I mean, it's. It's really wonderful. So again, uh, congratulations. So let's let's go ahead and get to to, to sort of some of the questions. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm very eager to jump right into uh, some of the recent kind of policy stuff. But actually, before we do that, Ben, just for the the sake of the listeners, if you could give a little bit of your background, how you got into this, how you you're a, you're a Brit, right? Uh, I right. mean, just from the act. So how you ended up in Germany? How you ended up working? Uh, in EU policy, and, and and I mean now that especially now that the UK has left the EU, and 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 so on and so forth. Oh, with with pleasure. Yes, I am uh, still for for my sins a Brit, a Brit abroad, uh, that beloved species of all native inhabitants <laughs> of lands across the globe. Uh, no, I've I've been in Germany about three years, uh, working in various um, think tanks, research institutions, and in policy. I was working at the EU Center of Excellence for Civilian Crisis Management in Berlin as well, but. Going back to the beginning, I actually started off as, a, as an investment banker a long time ago. Um, mm. Having gone into this thinking that's the most competitive thing you could do, and that, that appealed to me. And I got there, and the reality didn't actually match up to my expectations. It wasn't very fulfilling. So I thought, what, what can I do that would actually speak to my, my heart and soul a little more? I thought, I like what the EU is doing. Um, I like this idea of spreading democracy and to uh, help... Um, sustain the post-communist transitions that were such a big part of my childhood and youth growing growing up. Oh, yeah. So I went to work for the EU in the, in the Balkans um, and then in Ukraine and uh, also saw the downsides of our involvements in those countries, too, and how we didn't get things mm. right. And I eventually resigned from my EU job in Ukraine because I didn't think they were doing enough to do the right thing for Ukrainians. I thought it was a very self-serving exercise. And I write all about that in, uh, hate to say, another book that's coming out soon. Um, 
But right. after that, I, I went back to, to try and explore that dissatisfaction uh, that I felt by doing a PhD. And it's that PhD that led to the, to the book. Uh, and that continued my interest in Central and Eastern Europe. And I conducted a lot of research on the Czech Republic, Poland and Ukraine and wound up getting a job uh, in Prague, which actually by coincidence is where I'm sitting right now. Uh, I used to work just around the corner here in the Castle District as a policy advisor to the, to the foreign ministry, but also an academic researcher at the Institute of International Relations. And that really took me down the path of looking more and more at um, European security, its interactions with global security, and how that relates to democracy and values in our understanding of foreign policy. And those echoes now quite clearly come out this year. And it's really been able to be, it's been a great thing to be able to put that really hardcore into practice with regional expertise, plus a clear ideological focus born of analysis, uh, and to meet like-minded people that, such as yourself to, uh, to do it with. Yeah, I mean, that's been one of the coolest parts of this whole thing, right, is, is realizing, wow, we're not alone. You know, exactly. those, those of us who see this paradigm as warmed over and ridiculous, it's like, oh, my God, you know, there's a, <laughs> there's a new paradigm to be made, you know, and, that, and that, that's, certainly, that's certainly what it feels like right now. So you are, you, are, you are in Prague, but you are based in Berlin. Is that right? That's right. Absolutely. Okay, great. So, Ben, let me, let me, let me ask you kind of the burning question. Uh, because, you know, you were on the news yesterday saying that, you know, Schultz doesn't want Ukraine to win. You know, do you, do you still hold to that line? Well, Paul, to be fair, that was the day before yesterday. That was the day before. Oh, the, day, the, day be the, day be the day before yesterday. Yes. I, I'm sorry. For me, I'm remember, I'm six hours behind in Washington. So I, I see it in the morning, you know, um, <laughs> which no, you did all no day. Uh, but it's true. I did. I did say that. And it's been interesting to note since uh, since the announcement yesterday that everybody has rightly focused on the fact that this is great news for Ukraine. And the outcome is is exactly what we've been asking for. We could see some more tanks. That would be even better. But uh, it's been interesting to see some of Schultz's key supporters in the expert community in Berlin saying nothing has changed in the mindset. And that's an assessment I actually share. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. one that they say to reassure. It's one that might worry the rest of us, I think. Right. Because as we know, <laughs> it's, it was great that the leopards came, but boy, did they take their sweet time getting there. And that was down to one country in particular. Um, we could say that others should have done things sooner as well. And that's that's absolutely right. But um, what I've called the Germany's approach to this is moving at the speed of shame throughout the, uh, the last yeah, year. Yeah, that's good. Because all the breakthroughs in German weapons deliveries have only come under extreme pressure. And it, let's be clear, that pressure has come from inside as well as outside. So it's not a case that Germans don't want this. It's a case that the Schultz Chancellery in particular, because they've been calling the shots as per the Richtlinien Kompetenz or the, the Chefsacker, as it's known, the boss's, boss's stuff that he deals with was called in by Schultz to say, I'm in charge of this. And so they've been the ones dragging their feet. And I absolutely stand by that assessment that they've done that. And I was trying to explain that. And it's been interesting. A lot of people have said to me, you know, this, what, what I said that actually Schultz, he doesn't want Ukraine to win, but he also doesn't want Ukraine to lose. Let's be very clear mm -hmm. about that. This is not that uh, Schultz is on Russia's side. It's not, not the case. But that actually what I said as to why that would happen has the explanatory power that other people have been looking for, which is that this conflict, should there be a decisive victory either way, has the potential to transform the international system. It's a system transforming conflict. And I don't think, and I'm, I'm not alone in this, uh, that Olaf Scholz wants that. Um, and I don't think he wants it because he knows he and his vision for government is not up to the task of then making the change that Germany would need to adapt to that bigger transformation. And I stand yeah. I, 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 I should show my hand a little bit here that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm poking at you and having some fun. But I mean, I, I share your assessment. I mean, I, 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 I do. I do believe that uh, the Schultz government was hoping and wishing for stalemate uh, was was aiming at some kind of and hoping for some kind of ceasefire negotiated settlement, which, of course, would just be a you know prolonging of the conflict and ultimately has had to be kicking and dragging forced every step of the way into kind of embracing Ukrainian victory. I, I love that. And, and I guess maybe I'll link it below, but I but this, you know, this meme that's like German foreign policy, you know, and it goes down at the flow chart and it's like reluctantly changed. Of course, like we're all, we're amazing because 
we changed course. Isn't that, you know, and, the, and I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's hard not to, when it happens, call it amazing because it is, yeah. it is amazing to have the Germans on your side. It is wonderful it is. to see them come around finally. And I want to celebrate that always, but it is frustrating that it took this long, that it required this much circular reasoning, <laughs> you know, this, yeah. I mean, that it required at all this kind of crazy blackmail style standoff, uh, you know, yeah, so. I think you, you put it very well the other day when you said that we, we shouldn't give excess credit to Schultz for taking this process hostage. And I, I yeah. think that it's hard. Some, some are trying to do it, but it is hard to paint this as the, you know, the act of a master strategist who was after getting the, uh, yeah. the programs and the Swiss ammo all along. I mean, it's terrific that it's happened. I'm not quite sure that was the plan from the beginning. And yeah, it is. I mean, this, as what you said, it is amazing to have Germany on your side. That's why we all care about it so much. We Absolutely. know what Germany can do. And this has been my, my point from the beginning about this is the German contribution to victory for Ukraine, which is actually all of our victory, those who believe in democracy and the future of uh, free and liberal ordering. We need Germany as part of that. They could contribute so much and pushing to be able to contribute in line with that possibility, as well as with Germany's responsibility, historical to Ukraine and contemporary for the current conflict, as it uh, played an outsized role in indulging the Putin regime, um, is essential to be able to live up to that. And that's also in Germany's interest. And this has been, I mean, myself, Minna, others have been on the receiving end of a fair amount of flack, to put it mildly, for being Germany bashers. There's nothing further from the truth. We want the best for Germany. You know, I live in Germany. My, my daughter and my partner are German. Why would I be a Germany basher? There's no sense in it. It's to say, look, this is your interest and it's in line with your values and it helps all of us get to the party. Without a doubt. And I'm in the same boat. I mean, I, I, I lived in Germany for three years. I have a German host family. I yeah. studied German. You know, I, I thought I was going to do uh sort of trade agreements and stuff like that whatever happened to trade agreements right you know but 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 i mean the you know and 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 then and then the world just fundamentally changed but i was very much caught up in the same kind of notion of this is the future of foreign policy is trade and finance and all that kind of stuff and of course that um you know hasn't materialized but it's you know i mean it's 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 simon vaught who i think you might know a, a mutual a mutual friend of ours uh, tweeted this morning, you know, Vince, Vince klappt was Strategie. <laughs> and, and that's, that's, that's kind of how I, I, I see it, right? I mean, if it, if it works, it was strategy. And that, and that's, and that's what, that's what all of the, you know, the Schultz sort of, uh, Schultz Versteher, I guess, the, the Schultz, the Schultz, uh, apologists are now saying, well, no, look, he was able to get Abrams out of America and he was able to, it turned out he was just a master 4D chess. And it's like, no, he wasn't. I mean, no, I mean, come on, you know, but, it's but again, like, I, I guess I should levels of uh, of self delusion there. I think totally. Let, let I don't. I don't it. care. Let's get to the next step. That's the most important thing. Absolutely, he should. He should feel free to now claim as much credit as he wants, and everybody because I don't. I don't care. The point is, is that we got to where we needed to go, and we got there through. I think you're right. The speed of shame. So let's let's kind of talk about shame, <laughs> because because that's like of of great interest to me because it does seem like shame has been the factor that has moved Germany. Mm. Um, and I mean, how do you how do you read that over the last since since February 24th? Um, you know, I mean, the shutdown of Nord Stream 2, yeah. the, the, the transfer of weapons. I mean, we've gone from 5000 helmets not going to leopards going, you know, um, and, yeah. it's, and it's largely been the product of shame. So why? Why does shame move Germany? And how can we, I guess, it, it, more strategically use shame even if that's going to be the 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 you know the the grease that moves the german government yeah uh absolutely i mean two foreigners talking about german shame is a it's a very <laughs> classic classic discussion <laughs> to have that germans absolutely love of course uh, so I look forward to the f feedback on this from my uh, friends and colleagues around. Yeah, we're very uncontroversial in this show. Yeah, yeah, as, as you I know, we, we try to keep it very milk toast. <laughs> yeah, but why, why is it important to talk about it, first of all? Because those delays have not been cost free. Those delays can be measured in the cost of Ukrainian lives and Germany's reputation. And that's what has to, to, to change. And I think it's interesting to see that the, the shame dynamic and you know, shame gets a bad name, but it can be very productive, as we've we've seen. Um, the shame has come again from inside as well as from outside. Germany's allies saying, come on, you have to get with the program here. You are have uh, worked 
closely with the Putin regime, Wandel durch Handel, change through trade, which turned out to be just really about trade uh, and the benefits of it, um, made a special responsibility. Uh, Mikhail Roth, the head of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee in the Bundestag here, has talked about the um, Germany's trampling over the agency of Central East European countries, going yep. against what they said on Nord Stream, against them on Russian security, ignoring them and ignoring Ukraine. And I think it's that growing realization of, oh, my God, what have we done that has come to a growing section of the German population as they realize that the overtly morally superior position that their governments have taken for a number of years, saying, you know, we've overcome these old vices of nationalism, of war, of conflict. Um, and indeed, it's all about the convergence wager and all about um, trade and liberal economics leading to liberal politics. And rather looking down on those who still, you know, did dirty things like bought weapons and I mean, selling weapons was okay, but buying weapons, a little less, uh, less, um, slightly more déclassé, um, only to then realize that actually, hang on a minute, these things have come with a huge cost to us and that we've also... It, the reputation cost of the hypocritical policies of the last 20 years, the famous triple outsourcing that uh, it was Constanze Stelzenmuller who put it that Germany outsourced its security to the US, its energy to Russia and its trade to China. Um, mm -hmm. The chickens have come home to roost for Germany this year and realizing what that has meant and how under equipped they are to deal with this kind of situation, both in terms of material capabilities, but also mental outlook and mentality. Um, has been something that's been needed to to be addressed. And that's been very productively leveraged by allies um, and to build up pressure at a series of key points. It's also been productively leveraged by actors inside. So in Schultz's coalition uh, partner parties, the Greens and the FDP, they've put this to very good effect. Also the opposition, the CDU, have been able to do this as well, even though they were also responsible for a lot of the policy totally. of recent years. So shame has been extremely productive. Um, the, the trouble of it is, and I've written about this, is that it's a dynamic that the Schultz government have created for themselves by refusing to move until the shame reaches a certain level, it seems. And then it seems to work. So it's created an incentive for others to continue to do this. Rather than Germany yeah. seizing the initiative, which they could have done, for example, three, uh, two weeks ago on Leopards. Four days ago! Also, I mean, it's it's so I mean, it's, it's just this was such an own goal. Yeah. I mean, everyone was expecting this at Rammstein and then they <laughs> they just they just waited four days. They, I mean, it was it was totally no reason at all to take this yeah. reputational damage if you were going to do it anyway. You know, I mean, yeah. So I guess it depends which side of the I believe the Abrams was a masterstroke or not debate. Yeah, own, right. Man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, all oh, right. Yeah. Schultz got the Abrams out of America. It's like, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Well, no, I mean, that's a it's, a, it's a, it's an excellent evaluation. And obviously, we hope that one day, Germany will move beyond the need for shame in order to act within its own interest. You know, absolutely um, right. And to contribute, uh, as it can, as we've said, to um, the security of all, all democracies. Now, that this is where I think also the question is to However great this step was, is it Germany really turning the corner? Is this now the Titan vendor? That really does remain to be seen. Um, but it's not all bad news. In other ways, Germany has actually moved faster. So on energy transition, getting off Russian gas, for example, building two new liquid natural gas terminals and finding the alternative sources to fill those within nine months was an outstanding achievement. Uh, it was moving really at lightning speed. And that should be should be saluted. Yep, yep, and it's great you point that out because that's a, that just blew me away. I mean, you know, it was it was a, it's a wonderful thing. Of course, of course, never should have happened in the first place. But but I yeah. mean, you know, if you're fixing things, it's a big fix, yeah. and it went so fast. So it's 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 a real achievement. So Ben, there's one one last thing, and it's going to take a while. So it's you know, <laughs> it's not like just one last oh, okay. thirty second question. But let's talk about you are the father of a school of international relations essentially is that oh. is that right you are the you are the father of of the school of neo idealism you are yeah. the you are the you are the what is that the 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 the, the Stephen Walter the John Mearsheimer <laughs> of uh, no no i mean you're you uh, you have been advocating uh, uh an approach to international relations called neo idealism um tell us tell us what this is and also why it's not traditional idealism. Okay, well, thank, thanks for asking. And, and, um, and if I may also, 
what traditional idealism is. I mean, I mean, it's just a very, a very brief, 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 you know, a uh, uh, helpful hint for the listeners on just IR theory, because of course we all also know that like, it's a complicated and, and, and maybe not even necessary sideshow for a lot of foreign policy making, but it is important for, for, for sort of scholars and thinkers and the, and, and the people that write and, and influence a lot of this stuff. Well, th thanks very much for asking. And I'm quite sure John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt will appreciate the comparison as much as I do. Um, that will be, a, you know, everybody wins from that one, right? Um, yeah, okay, so um, why neo-idealism and why is it not actually an irrelevant abstract sideshow? It comes out of observation of the response of certain countries to the Russian invasion, reinvasion of Ukraine. Uh, it comes from looking at what President Zelensky has been doing, but also what certain leaders, uh, so Kaya Kalas of Estonia, Zana Marin of Finland, uh, Jan Lipavsky, who's the foreign minister in Prague, sitting just around the corner from where I am now, um, the, uh, the Baltic states more generally, their response to this, and also elements that we've seen from other European actors, so the European Commission to an extent, um, some parts of the UK's response, even some parts of Annalena Baerbock's talk on, on Germany. So this is comes partly from observation and analysis, and then also from aspiration to say, by actually intellectually gathering this together, you can provide a better rallying point and a platform to do better things with it. So that's the, the motivation behind. So what is neo-idealism? It's a way of looking at international relations that says, actually, we should put values first, that our values are our interests, and that we should conceive these values, so things like human rights, fundamental freedoms, democratic governance, liberal, uh, socially and culturally liberal societies, and crucially, the, the right of citizens in those societies to a more hopeful future, to progress, effectively, which we lost the idea of in parts of the West, um, we should set those up as ideals to strive for. So even if we don't consistently live up to them now, it doesn't mean they're dead, and it means we should be working towards them. We should be working towards them because they're good in and of themselves, but also because they're crucial vectors for human progress and for actually the kind of benefits that really free societies can bring if we let them. So it's about reorganizing our vision of ourselves in, in the West, about defending democracy where it's threatened, standing up for that, and strengthening the kind of liberal and democratic ordering that also supports democratic societies. And that's what the smaller states in particular, it comes more naturally to them to, to see this. But what I'm arguing is that all democratic states should view this. Um, so for example, the, the restraint coalition in the, uh, in the US, favorites of both you and I, um, they, they would say, no, the US should only engage in the world when its vital interests are at stake. And I'm, what I would say is actually the future of the democratic order and the rights and freedoms of people in other democratic societies are also your vital interests because of the interconnected nature of our, our security. National security is never national. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that we make. We're fundamentally entangled with each other, uh, but that doesn't mean we can't do it in a particularly American, particularly Czech or particularly German way. All right, so what's original idealism in international relations? Nothing to do with Hegel. Don't worry, we're not going down that, that route. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, there, was, there was a brief and short-lived so-called idealist moment between the wars um, where people such as Alfred Simon, Norman Angel, Philip Noel Baker um, said there could actually be progress in international affairs. And it was almost as simple as that. Now, um, they were called idealists, not by themselves, but by E.H. Carr, uh, this influential historian, uh, very influential for realists uh, throughout the years, who effectively tried to smear them with the tag of being idealists, woolly-headed utopians, in contrast to his clear-eyed review of the world as it really is. And that's the same trick that Mearsheimer and others still try to pull today. Uh -huh. uh, Stephen Walt even had a, an op-ed in Foreign Policy where he said, but in the peace negotiations are not just for woolly-headed idealists. And so if, if you doubt, uh, uh, this is not a caricature, they actually say these things. Now, the problem is that none of these idealists were really that idealist in any way apart from saying there could be progress in international relations, which basically just means rejecting the tragic realist view of the world. One who did stand out a little bit more was Woodrow Wilson and his famous Making the World Safe for Democracy um, uh, and so on. But unfortunately, he was rather let down by his views on race, among many other things, which pretty much fatally undermined the claim to be an idealist in any sense that we would understand today. So what I would say is that what neo-idealism brings to idealism is the ideals, actually, themselves. And what it takes from the old idealism is the notion of progress in international affairs. And it then builds on the liberal internationalist tradition of saying 
the, the domestic society matters as well. But it goes way beyond liberal internationalism in terms of its commitment to actually doing something about this and also in treating international institutions, for example, as means rather than ends. A lot of people get it confused with neoconservatism. They haven't worked out there's a difference between uh, defending democracy and promoting it at gunpoint. And that's a pretty big distinction you need to make. Also, it's not as culturally uh, conservative or economically elitist as neoconservatism. So there's a lot of things to, to work through here. But I'm really excited by the reaction to this. And I, again, appreciate you asking, because I think figuring out the answers to these kind of things about how we do grand strategy in a better way is key to Germany's real Titan vendor, if you want, but also key to the, um, the bigger transition that we need in democratic ordering. Yeah, I mean, excellent explanation. Um, <laughs> so surprisingly clear and concise for, 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 for international relations theory. And of course, I'm, you know, I'm being a, a little facetious when I say it's a sideshow. Obviously, you know, international relations theory has underpinned a lot of the actual response uh, of governments around the world. And I would I would very much say that people like John Mearsheimer, Stephen Wald, Samuel Cherup and, 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 you know, others like that have influenced the U.S. response. And in fact, you know, I mean, that that very famous now op ed of, you know, Western weapons won't do anything to help Ukraine win. You know, I, I mean, I mean, it, it, it I should say infamous rather than. Famous. But, you know, I mean, it it it, it clearly influenced our response in not sending the weapons that we could have sent, you know. Uh, so even even the notion that we've been struggling with consistently, consistently of oh, the fears of escalation, that sending Bradleys will lead to escalation or sending Patriots will lead to escalation or sending tanks will lead to, all that stuff comes from this realist sort of restrainer school, you know. So, I mean, you're, you're, you're absolutely correct in, in kind of you're essentially offering an, a new set of axioms from yeah. which to consider and think about international relations that actually reflect. I mean, it's and here's, I guess, my one gripe a little bit yeah. is your thoughts actually reflect the world as it is. I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I always I always have this issue that we've quasi seeded the ground of realism to realists yeah. when, in fact, yeah. they're the make believe ones. They're the they're the ones that constantly you know, kind of uh, uh, come up with these abstract, academic, oh, oh, if we send javelins, Russia will use nuclear weapons. Right. You know, it's like, yeah. no, what? what are, well, listen to yourself for mean, one second. The, uh, the greatest trick the IR devil ever pulled was letting realism get away with calling itself realism. It's, I, I, absolutely. It, and th there's a very good new book I'd recommend everyone to read by a guy called Matthew Spector, uh, who's a brilliant thinker called The Atlantic Realists, which will tell you the history of how realism got its name and why it's anything but. Uh, and I think there's, if there's one thing I would take from one, uh, that there are a lot I take from thinkers of all kinds, actually. I'm not a dogmatic uh, person, but something I would take from one of the founders of neoconservatism, uh, Irving Kristol, who said, ideas matter because ideas uh, determine how we perceive reality. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what you've put your finger on there with how the realists have influenced policy um, while being completely unrealistic in this. And the reaction I've had from ordinary people who I've inflicted this upon on Twitter, um, as well as uh, from experts, is actually, yeah, look, this, this is a different lens through which we can see the world. And it's a lens that can be useful in determining our strategic options. Absolutely. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I just, I badly, and I guess the long term, the realists should be called short-term transactionalists or transactionalism or something like this. And, and the idealists should be called realists, you know, I mean, cause they're actually, they're the ones that are legit, you know, I, I mean, viewing the world for what it is. So that, that's, 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 that's my one. So I guess I just, I, I'm sad we're, we're sticking with the label idealist. Cause I, I, I it's, this isn't ideal. This isn't idealism at all. I guess I you want know. to redeem the notion of idealism as well, of having something to strive for, yeah. something bigger than yourself, something motivating and something that brings us together on a journey and as a quest, rather than saying this is the world completed as the realists have it. I'd say, you know, this, this is our way to the world as it can be. And every step we take along there is not necessarily going to be easy, but it's worth it. And that's been the big lesson for me of this year is how many people want to come on that journey. Yeah. Something to strive for goals and politics. Absolutely correct. I mean, I, yeah. I, that's a wonderful takeaway. I mean, it's it's a it's been a horrific, horrific year. But at the same time, seeing the valor and the courage and the fighting spirit 
that's come out of Ukraine and, 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 and that's been inspired in, in you and Jessica and other countries and even seeing Germany make this transformation. I mean, it's, it's given meaning to politics again. That's been very much missing yeah. in the West for a very long time. So that's an excellent point. Ben, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're an inspiration. You're doing really great work. Keep it up. I hope you'll be a regular. We'll come on again and, and continue to talk about this as, as, we, as we head toward Ukrainian victory in 2023. Yes. You, you know I will. I'm very much looking forward to the next chat. Great to talk today, Paul. Thanks for all you, that you've done, and keep it up. Speak yep. soon. Same to you. Bye-bye. Yeah.